Okay, welcome to this track on sexuality and gender. Warmly welcome. Can you hear me if I speak without a microphone? Or do yes. you prefer? You, you can hear me? Yes. That's true for everyone? Yes. Move closer up if you have, uh, closer to the front if you are, have difficulties. It's a release for me not to have been, yeah. uh, been forced to use the microphone. So. Okay, great, thanks. We will have two 60 minutes uh, sessions, one today and one tomorrow, which in one sense is a lot of time, in another sense it's just horrible, inadequate to address such huge, complex, painful, difficult, challenging subject as all those different issues uh, relating to body, to sexuality, to relationships, to identity, both in our culture and how we view it as Christians in a biblical perspective. But I hope we will be able to cover at least some of the issues and that we will have also time for, uh, for questions and interactions. So I will not speak all the time. Uh, this, uh, this session, I will try to describe what has happened within our culture and give the basic Christian framework for understanding sexuality. And then tomorrow, we will move into the really hot button issues of homosexuality and of the trans ideology and issues related to, to those. So I will save them for tomorrow so we have a good time to wrestle with them. Okay, then you know my, my, the basic outline of those two sessions. Looking forward to interact with you and, and that we can help each other because this is difficult. Uh, and we also come from different contexts where the issues are discussed from slightly different perspectives. Maybe it's not tomorrow, but the day of Sunday. Uh, you, will, uh, you will notice they make, uh, made, uh, make a change. They had made a change in the program. So the track will be tomorrow and the free time will be on Sunday. Okay, sorry. The issues are discussed slightly different within different uh, contexts and cultures. Uh, even though you can say the basic challenges are, uh, are the same, uh, but we, they are approached slightly different because of our different histories and, and different, uh, yeah, just a different context. Okay, let's pray before we, uh, we continue. Lord, I thank you that uh, we have this privilege of being gathering here at Foyer as your people, that we have the freedom to, to worship you and to listen to your word and to uh, listen to each other and, and be a blessing to each other. I pray that that will be true of these two afternoons, that you will, uh, that you will bless us and that you will help us to, uh, to be a blessing to each other, sharpen our minds and even more warm our hearts. Pray that you will help us to be driven by, by the gospel, by grace, and by truth in that combination that uh, you, Lord, uh, so uniquely uh, expressed. Pray that in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 We are living in really strange times. The day before yesterday, Jordan Peterson was in, in London and tens of thousands of people were gathered to listen to him and he had a number of special guests for his uh, talk show. And one of them was Douglas Murray, who is an atheist, who is a gay person, but politically is conservative, you can say. And one of the things he said from, from the scene was this. Our brightest mind used to work out how to fly us to the moon. Now we've forgotten what a woman is. That was his way of expressing what a strange, strange time we are living in. What, what surprising questions we are discussing in our time. And as I said, he's an atheist, he's not a, uh, not a Christian. But he expresses here what so many in our culture think. Uh, or feels today, it's, it's such a strange time. And this is what we have to 
trying to grapple with how to be disciples of Jesus in such a confusing time. What I will be trying to give you is a form of apologetics for sex. Apologetics means to explain and defend the truth. And here, to explain the content of a Christian view of sexuality and to defend a Christian view of sexuality. And do that uh, in contrast to or in dialogue with what's happening in our culture. I saw this, uh, this sign some years ago, outside the church. Please, no explanations inside the church. <laughs> I'm sure it was, it was directed toward uh, tourist guides uh, who took groups into a church and disturbed <laughs> services and, and the, the uh, prayer of people there. But this is so typical for many churches for decades now. They've just been silent. Whole culture is speaking constantly about issues relating to sexuality. And in the church, very often it's silence, or if something is said, it's just a kind of proclamation or presentation of this is what the Bible says, but no explanation. Why on earth this perspective? Why hold on to that understanding of sex? We need to get rid of that attitude. As Christians, we just have to start to talk about sex. What does it mean to be a bodily physical, sexual being. As soon as we approach that kind of subject, we need to be deeply aware that all of us are coming with a, with a backpack of memories and experiences and feelings that relates to being a bodily person, being a sexual person. For some, it can be mainly a joyous joy in the backpack. But for so many, it's, there is pain, there is shame, there are things others have done to us or what we have done to others that is part of our experience of this whole area. And therefore we, we need to talk about those issues with compassion because this is an area where so many of us are deeply hurt and it does not help to just having stones thrown at you. I often speak about this to students, and then, of course, feel really awkward. Here I'm a, a more than 60 years old man speaking to young people. How on earth is it possible for me to connect? Uh, and, of course, there's a lot of things that... that uh, separates me from a younger generation. But still, we're human beings that connects us. Still, we're part of exactly the same universe that connects us. And I found to my surprise that it's actually possible to have a dialogue across different generational gaps, also on issues on sexuality, if both sides are willing to do some work and try to listen and try to understand. Always when I talk about this, I start uh, with this perspective. As soon as we talk about things related to ethics, right and wrong, we will face a huge problem. We will always face the problem of the gap between our ethical ideal and our reality. Think about it. You know the, the principle, you should not lie. Have you lied? Some of you nodded and the rest of you lied just now. <laughs> okay, everyone agrees you should not lie. Have we always applied that? No, there's always a gap. You can take whatever ethical principle you want and you will find that gap. And you will find that in the area of sexuality. So how do Christians handle that gap? Well, two ways are the most common ways. One way is you can lower in the ethical bars so the ethical standards in your life are synced. Easy way. That's liberal theology. So there is no gap. 
because your ethics just describe your own life. The other way is hypocrisy. Everyone pretends that they are living fully according to the ethical principle. And the key thing is not to be uh, exposed, because then you're just kicked out of the fellowship and condemned and really ugly. We need to find a third way. And that is the gospel solution. We don't lower the, the ethical bar. And we don't want to have a fellowship of hypocrisy and harshness. Not at all. The solution to the gap is first God's grace. That is forgiveness for our history. We come with a backpack and we can put it at the cross and have a new start. And we all of us need forgiveness in this area. And secondly, God's spirit. Sanctification. That the spirit of God will help us to start to live a life where our own life started to approach the ethical standard, a new life, walking in the light. So I hope we can have a discussion on those issues with the gospel perspective uh, in mind. I love this quote. It's from a, a <clears throat> theologian in the 1950s, but I think it's spot on. He says this, the typical modern man practically never thinks about sex. What? Hang on. He dreams of it, of course, by day and by night. He craves for it. He pictures it. Is stimulated or depressed by it. Drools over it. But this Frodo, steaming activity is not thinking. Drooling is not thinking. Picturing is not thinking. Craving is not thinking. Dreaming is not thinking. Thinking means to bring the power of the mind to bear. Thinking about sex means striving to see sex in its innermost reality and in the function it is meant to serve. Okay, let's do some thinking about sex, shall we? I think this is, this is spot on. Our culture is really preoccupied by all things sexual. But we do not really think about what this is. When I've tried to think about it historically, uh, I come to think that cultures, historically, of course, there is a wide variety of, of, uh, of thinking, but you can summarize them by saying cultures have decided to go in one of four directions, generally. And sometimes within the same culture, groups have chosen uh, one of these, these four. So four different views on sex. Some cultures have basically had the perspective that this is a natural urge. This is like hunger and thirst and the need to sleep. Uh, just go for it. You can express yourself sexually basically in, in any way. Sometimes they put up some limitation, but the whole direction is to try to broaden the area of sexuality. It will often become much of a quantitative uh, view of sex, to have much sex with many people in different, in different forms. So you go in that uh, direction. And uh, we can think in uh, modern time of the playboy philosophy. Sex is the driving force on the planet, you have no said. We should embrace it, not see it as an enemy. So embrace sexuality and live it out. Kind of borderless view on sex. You can find this in antiquity, of course. In, in the Greek and Roman culture. Part of that culture was very promiscuous. Others have looked at that and said, no, that is a really selfish, ugly uh, way where people are hurting each other and are hurting themselves. Now, actually, this is, a, this is an ugly part of human life. It should be ignored or suppressed or used as little as possible. Maybe we have to have sex in order to procreate, 
But that is, that, that's it. Try to limit it as much as possible. Unfortunately, some of the church father had this perspective. Sex is only for procreation. Sexual desires came with the fall, they thought. So it's not, it comes not from God, but from the devil. And even within a marriage, you should have, only have sex for procreation, and you should not enjoy it. So a very negative view of sex from some of the church fathers. Other cultures have said, no, no, no. It's the absolute opposite. It's not that sex comes from the devil. This is a path to God. So they marry spirituality and sex. And we see that most clearly in some Hindu versions with the tantric sex, where the religious ecstasy and the orgasm goes together. And sex will open your, your mind for an encounter with God. So here, of course, sex is viewed as really positive, but it's directly connected to how you connect with God. It's a path to salvation. Very dangerous thought to combine two of man's, humankind's strongest uh, forces, spirituality and sex. And fourthly, a number of cultures have said, no, sex is good. It has its place. It does not connect with God. It's not the road to salvation, but it, it's not ugly, unclean, it's good and positive, but within a certain area. And then they have tried to draw out this area. Within this area, sex is good, should be enjoyed, it's positive. Outside that area, sex takes on another dimension. And cultures have not always been in total agreement how to carve out that area. But the basic understanding is there is an area where this should be affirmed. And then there are areas outside where it shouldn't be a first. It's obvious that Western culture has gone from a kind of mixture, I would say, from a balanced view from the Christian faith and some negative from the suppressed, because we have had those tendencies also within the church of having a negative view towards sex, so a mixture of suppressed and balanced. And now we are moving really fast up in the corner of a boundless view of sexual, sexuality. How come? Why is the Western world, with its long Christian history now, so quickly moving up in that corner? Is that possible to understand? Eric uh, Erickson, a, a famous uh, psychologist, Harvard University, he wrote a, a, a book called Identity, Youth, uh, Youth and Crisis. And he asked this question, how did man's need for individual identity evolve? Before Darwin, the answer was clear because God created Adam in his own image as a counterplayer of his identity. And then, so he refers to the, our Christian understanding of the human being. And then he says later on, I admit to not having come up with any better explanation. So he as a psychologist see the young generation struggling with all this question of identity. And the previous answer, that you are created in the image of God, is now gone. But there is no really good answer replacing that answer. And now we find our culture in a desperate hunt for identity because there is no answer given. You have to figure out yourself who you are, what your identity is, how you should understand your body, how you should understand your sexuality. It goes, it goes back to you. And you can say the whole development in the Western world has created uh, what can be called the perfect storm. Perfect storm is an expression where several different forces come together and create a really powerful storm, a perfect storm. And Western culture have rejected God, the 
previous foundation of our culture and of our understanding of life. Instead, we have put ourself, the self, at the center of the universe and in the self, we have put sexuality at the center. If we had more time, we could go through this development. And so I'm just throwing out uh, this at you now. But I'm, uh, I'm absolutely convinced that this is what has happened in, in our culture and that you can show this progress. No God, instead of God, ourself, and within ourself, sexuality. And that has created a perfect storm we are experienced now in culture. Most people don't really see this. And here's a, uh, here is a quote from the philosopher Wittgenstein, and I think he captures something really important. He says this, a picture held us captive, and we could not get outside it, for it lay in our language, and language seems to repeat it to us inexorably. I think that is a really deep insight, how, insight into how culture works. A culture moves into a new phase, and then it becomes a picture that you live within. And it's really difficult to see that you're living within that picture. It holds you prison in your mind and through the language, and you, it's echoed from everywhere. And that is what's happening in our culture now in terms of, of sexuality. No God, the self at the center, sexuality at the center of yourself. That is the picture that so few people today can come outside. And that's why it's so difficult to discuss those questions, because we are imprisoned in that, in that picture. We could have looked on the process how God was replaced by the self. Could have looked at the process of how the self became the center. But let's look at the process of how sexuality came at the center of ourself. That is what we call the sexual revolution. In Sweden, everyone knows this picture. Uh, even though it's an Italian film. It's a film, The Dolce Vita. Uh, many film critics think it's one of the best films of the 20th century, Fellini's movie. And we know about it because it's a Swedish sex symbol from the 60s. And that is an iconic scene from the movie. This movie begins like this. There are two helicopters flying over Rome. Under the first one, there is a sculpture of Christ. And we're told that it's going to be moved from one church to a museum. Behind it is another helicopter with five young male journalists. And their task is to follow this other helicopter to report about the displacing of the Christ statue. They are flying very low over Rome, Rome. And they pass over a hotel. And on the roof of the hotel, there is a pool. And at the pool, there are a number of young, beautiful women in bikinis. Much more interesting than Christ. So the journalist tells the helicopter pilot to stop and start to circle over the hotel and try to make contact with the, with the, uh, the girls down there. And the Christ stature just disappears. And the message is really clear. La dolce vita. The, uh, the beautiful, enjoyable life is not in Christ. It is in sexuality. A lot of people think that Sweden was the, the nation that opened the door for the sexual revolution. In one sense, it's true. And no, we did. Denmark did. Together, <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> unfortunately, Sweden and Denmark are famous for opening the door for the sexual revolution. But actually, you cannot understand it by just looking at our countries. Unfortunately, it's true. We, we did some real damage in the late 50s and during the 60s. But you have to go, go to Austria and Germany in the 20s and 30s. And here you find this man, Wilhelm Rasch. And he's the man who coined the... 
the formulation, the sexual revolution. He said that the Christian understanding, the traditional understanding of sexuality is the dead trying to suffocate the living. So tradition is coming around your neck and suffocating you. We need to liberate this area of life. So he wrote the book with the title, The Sexual Revolution. And as all revolutionaries, he identified, this is where we are suppressed and this is the way we should go. And here is his revolutionary program. We need to abolish lifelong monogamous marriage. We need to encourage infantile and adolescent sexuality. We need to start to see that suppression of sexual impulses is destructive. So if you have a sexual impulse, a desire to do something sexual, it's always destructive to try to hold it back. Therefore, the whole category of sexual perversion, we should get rid of that. The perverse is what is outside, what is right, what is the good. It's on the other side of that. But there's no such thing. That whole category needs to disappear. There's nothing as sexual perversion. And you look at that and you have to say, this revolution has been really successful. With one exception, I would say. We don't affirm children and sexuality. There's still a strong taboo <coughs> against pedophilia. But on all the others, his revolution won. And of course, there are individual cases of ped pedophilia and, uh, and so on. But still, generally in culture, uh, if you argue against pedophilia, you would have a huge major majority in media and everything behind you. But that you will not have on any of the other issues. But actually, you cannot understand the sexual revolution in Germany and Austria, and we could have looked into Freud, he is the key figure here, but you need to go back to the Enlightenment, to the person who is called the founder of eroticism, and that is Marquise de Sade. Marquise is a, is a title, so his name was uh, uh, de Sade. It's from his last name we have the word sadism, to have sexual pleasure by inflicting pain on someone else. And that was one of the practices he did with horrible results for the people he did it to. He was a man of the Enlightenment. He fully understood if there is no God, there is no moral norms. If there is no moral norms, I'm free to do whatever I can. Whatever can be done, or whatever is possible to do, I'm free to do. Whatever can be done, I'm free to do it. It will, in the end, just become an issue of your physical strength what you can do to another person. And he illustrated this in his own life and spent uh, a number of periods in jail because of what he did to prostitutes and what he did to, uh, to women, and he led, uh, did a horrible life. The sexual revolution goes back to the Enlightenment, to the dethronement of God, and in its place, the human self took center and in the self, sexuality became the center. Put it in, in, in another way, you can say that the sexual revolution, we don't speak of it in terms of, of uh, history of ideas, but just look at what is it actually saying. It wants to separate all the previous context for sex. So the sexual revolution say, of course you can have sex when you are married, of course. But you can also have sex before and outside and with people you are not married to. Marriage is not a, a, the context, the context for sex. Of course you can have, have sex when you are in love with someone, but you don't have to limit it to that. You have a uh, badminton partner or a tennis partner, you play, once a week, and you can have a sex partner. You have sex once a week. Not because you care about each other, or there is love or commitment. In the same way, 
you don't have to care about your badminton partner. Partner, it's just that you are equally good and you you, you have good matches for one hour a week, and then you, your life does not touch. You can think about that like when it comes to sex. So therefore, sex does not does not need to belong to a, a permanent relationship. It can, of course, but it can also be a one night stand, very temporary. Of course, we still have sex in order to have kids. Uh, but you can also disconnect, of course, sex from the possibility of procreation. And people do that. That's why we have so many abortions. People have sex and are then surprised of the consequence that there is a child. And that was not planned, and that was not in... And then they... In our culture, we get rid of the consequences of our, of our sexual encounters. And now recently we, we have moved in, so we, we don't think that our bodies really give any signals about what is right and wrong in terms of sex. So we can ignore what the body tells us. So we, the sexual revolution tries to free sex for every possible limitation that traditionally has been put around sex. Could you explain, sorry, the last point again about the body? Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, if, if uh, I can give two examples of, of what I mean. I will come, we will come back to that tomorrow, so I will, I will say more about it then. But if you look at the male body and the female body, it's obviously that they, as bodies, give heterosexual signals. So it's a male body and a female body that, or male genitalia or female genitalia, that natural fits together and can be united. Two female bodies cannot unite, two male bodies cannot, for the body, the natural <laughs> way for the body, be united. Uh, evolutionary, if, I, if I'm free to use that argument, procreation is the main point of our sexuality. It's only the male-female relationship that is fertile. Two males and two females cannot have children. In our culture, we talk about that, that those two men are having, having a child, but they have borrowed from the heterosexual side, of course. Uh, and the other example in, is in trans ideology, where, uh, where we say the inner feeling of belonging to, uh, to a, certain, uh, a certain sex trumps what your body says. So, you have a male body, but inside yourself, your experience is that you are a woman. And historically, of course, people would have said, we don't deny that you have that feeling, but in this tension here, you should go with, with what the body tells you and try to adjust your inner feeling to that. But today we say, no, you can totally ignore the body because your inner feeling uh, is much more important. And therefore, you go with your inner feeling and you, you can change then because of modern medicine and, and surgery and so on, hormones. You can, if you want, change your body so it starts at least to align with your inner feeling. Uh, that, that kind of thinking would be unthinkable uh, just a, a number of uh, decades ago. So that's how we have separated our understanding of sex from, from the body. Again, if we had a, a lot of time, let's go through what, what has the sexual revolution done to, to our society? And I have all the statistics from Sweden in terms of what has it done to marriage? What has it done to how we view the unborn? What is happening in the area of sexual transmitted disease? What is happening in the area of pornography? What is happening in the area of infidelity? What's happening in the area of sexual crimes and rapes? 
all those figures are just skyrocketing. Singleness and loneliness. Singleness and loneliness, young females struggling with uh, uh, mental health issues that's related to many more factors than sexual <laughs> religion, but that I argue that it's part of that picture. And I, I would really encourage you to go through the statistics for your uh, own country. My, and most obvious was the Me Too movement showing that we have not solved the issue of sexuality. The sexual revolution has not solved the whole issue of how should we really relate to each other sexually. The Me Too movement showed a horrible picture of how men and women relate to each other sexually. I said Sweden took the lead in the sexual revolution. Which country had the biggest Me Too movement in the world? Rhetorical question. Sweden. Horrible picture of what's happening within the realm of sexuality. Here is uh, Francis Fukuyama, world-known historian and sociologist. He, uh, he wrote the book, The Great Disruption. That is his term for the last 50 years, the period when the sexual revolution really had, had a breakthrough in our culture. And he said this, one of the greatest frauds perpetrated during the Great Distortion, the last 50 years, was the notion that the sexual revolution was gender neutral, benefiting women and men equally, and that it somehow had a kinship with the feminist revolution. In fact, the sexual revolution served the interests of men, and in the end put sharp limits on the gains that women might otherwise have expected from the liberation from traditional uh, roles. So, sexual revolution has not had good fruits. And it's interesting now, young non-Christian feminists are saying the same. If you want to read something uh, in English, this is a very good book, Louis Perry's book, The Case Against the Sexual Revolution. Young feminist woman, she's not a Christian, but she just sees through what the sexual revolution has done to women and to the relationship between men and women. Even the trends are doing that now. So. Okay. Yeah. We come back to the trans issue tomorrow. Yes. About uh, Louise Perry, specifically, I'm backing your, your point. I've watched a few uh, YouTube videos. She has an interview with um, a person, I think it last week, two hour interview. She goes over a lot of her points, very thoughtful discussion. Um, I highly recommend it. Thank you. So, Louise Perry on YouTube. Uh, Look out for that. Yes. So I don't know if we can ask things, but it's not like the middle, uh, like a, the society, society admitting that uh, they are doing wrong with their open sexuality. I mean, for two decades, selling your body for a good job and money, it was okay. But then they realize something's wrong there. But can we say that the same happens at now and then, like, with the hippie sexuality, then they go to the limits and then they go back to uh, things that we as Christians declare for <laughs> centuries. They don't say that you're right, but it's like society goes to the edge and then they say something is wrong there. Can we say that also for me too? And that, uh, that culture swings back to a, a better understanding? Back to our beliefs as Christianity. Automatically, uh, yeah. it's happening, you know? Unfortunately, uh, that is not what I'm seeing. So people in Sweden uh, criticized through Me Too the selfish way that men used their power and their sexuality to, uh, uh, to uh, press women to have sex. Uh, but there was, uh, there was no discussion at all about the sexual revolu revolution as such. It is like, in, in Sweden, it's like using a curse word in the church if you try to questioning the sexual revolution as such, saying the whole idea is wrong. So, and, and I, I think that goes for most, at least Western European countries, that it's possible to, to criticize 
a limited area and say, oh, that was ugly, that shouldn't be. But then people do not zoom out to see what's, what is that part of. That's part of the sexual revolution. We need to have a different perspective on sex altogether. So far, that has not happened. So Louise Perry, she is a, um, she's an interesting voice, <laughs> but her perspective has not become a kind of dominant voice in, in the media. So I would say sexual revolution is still progressing. Hmm. I mean, terrible. But also the um, time. Yeah. We, we don't see um, uh, the the knowledge of what sexual sexual revolution was isn't really well known in the general public. So, for example, the whole link with pedophilia, which was very prominent in the sixties in France, for example, with uh, Simone de Beauvoir and and uh, Sartre and so on pleading to the government to allow pedophilia, uh, that's not known in the general public. Very few people would know about that, that link of the yeah. more sordid stuff. That, that is true. There were, was a period when pedophilia was, was accepted. It was the same in Sweden with the gay movement. They had a, a, a special section for pedophilia. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, uh, but that's not true any longer, so they have, they have yeah, dismissed yeah. that. But uh, it was part, and it, kind of logical part of the... Uh, uh, of the sexual revolution. Hmm. I've seen that my, my, most of my time has gone. Uh, what I would like to do is to say something about what is the Christian understanding in, in contrast to the sexual revolution. Uh, and maybe I say a few words about that, and then we can have a, a uh, we have some some time for for Q and A. If we as Christian want to go into this discussion, I think we should have this quote uh, with us. Uh, for the Christian, the first moral question shifts from what am I forbidden to do to how do I live a life of sexual love that conforms to my dignity as a human person. Too often in the churches, there has been this, a discussion on what is the limit? What are you not allowed to do? And of course, sooner or later, if you discuss sexual ethics, you will come to that kind of, of issues. But that cannot be the starting point. We need to start with a broader picture of what does it mean to be a human person? And what does it mean to express oneself sexually so it accords with the fact that I am a human person with, with dignity. That needs to be the starting point. We need to have a bigger perspective. And I think we can find that in the Bible. In the Bible, we, we find a very positive view of sex. You know, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, he said this, I would only believe in a God who knows how to dance. And that is his view to say, Christianity in God just limits life, uh, destroys joy, uh, it's a horrible oppressor. Uh, God cannot dance, God cannot enjoy life, or if you're a Christian and believe in God, you cannot enjoy life. Now, that's such a false view, of course. We believe in a God who can dance, and you can, you can read the Song, of Songs, uh, the Song of Songs if you want the celebration of sensuality, of body, of smell, of, of, of the senses. It's a beautiful love song. There are other dimensions that a song of between a man and woman, but it's obviously a song about the beauty of the love between man and <clears throat> woman. Our starting point as Christians is Genesis 1 and 2. Genesis 1, where, where God has created us as male and female, and where the first thing he says to those who is in his image is, have sex, or to quote God more correctly, multiply, be fruitsome, and fill the earth. But that you can only do by having sex. So the sexual dimension of the <coughs> is part of God's intention. And in chapter 2, we have this beautiful story about the man and the woman in the garden, and the loneliness of the man. No one is on his level. God is far above, animals is far below. 
And then God creates a woman who is on his level, corresponds to him, but not being the same. And then God gives the instruction. Therefore, because you are now in those two versions of my image, therefore, a man should leave his uh, uh, mother, uh, uh, mother, and fa man, uh, father, mother and father and uh, hold fast to his wife, and they two shall become one. And we know that Jesus quotes this in Matthew 19 when he's asked about divorce and marriage and remarriage. He zooms out before he answers that and quotes those two passages, combined them into one. Haven't you read? That he who created them from the beginning made a male and female, Genesis 1, and said, therefore, because humankind are, are in those two versions, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. <clears throat> I like how John Stott has elaborated to this. He says that if you take what God said in Genesis 2, you will have the Christian understanding of marriage and of sex. And he breaks it down like this. The Christian understanding of marriage and sex is that marriage is a monogamous relationship, therefore a man and his wife. So polygamy is outside God's intention. It's a heterosexual relationship, therefore a man should hold on to his wife. It is a relationship that means a change of the social status. You leave your father and mother. In our culture, that's not a big thing. You move away from home to, uh, to study and you live in a dorm. It's, it's not a big social change. In antiquity, in a culture where you're called to honor your father and mother, this is a big thing. You're not breaking free from that unit to, to create a new societal unit, uh, unity. So that means it is a relationship with social and public consequences, because you are now setting up a new unit. And ideally, that is a, a lifelong uh, relationship, lifelong fidelity. You should uh, hold fast to, you should be glued to. And then that new relationship is completed in the sexual union you become one flesh. Notice you do not become married by having sex with someone. Sometimes Christians teach that. Very complicated teaching. If I should apply that in Sweden, horrible results. If people are married to everyone they've had sex to. <laughs> That's not work. In the Bible, you do not become married by having sex with someone. That's called sexual immorality. If you have just sex with someone you're not married to. It's not, oh no, now you have created a marriage. It's sexual immorality. That's why in the marriage ceremony, when the two have said yes to the promises, then they hear the word, I hereby proclaim you man and wife. So marriage is established by entering the covenant, by saying yes to each other, and then that is then completed in the sexual union. So what you have said with your mouth, yes, I will belong to you for the rest of my life, you then say with your body, I belong to you, I give myself to you. But it is actually in that order. If you were a secular audience, people would just, they would just be upset. You cannot have that, that view on sex, they would say. My, my response, that it belongs only to a lifelong marriage covenant. My response to that is that I think the Christian view takes seriously what everyone knows about sex. We know that sex is a unique bodily act. Think of it. In our laws, we make a distinction between physical assault and rape. Why is that? Why don't have one, one law for physical assault? To have someone hitting you in the stomach, that's one physical body part, uninvited, doing something with you, what is rape? It's just another 
physical body part doing something invited on you. But everyone knows you cannot think like that. Because the sexual act is absolutely unique and cannot be compared to physical violence. You don't have a trauma two decades later if someone has punched you <coughs> in the stomach. But if someone has raped you, that can be a really long trauma because it's a different kind of act. That is what Christianity tells us. This is a different kind of act than other physical acts. Therefore, it belongs to a specific context. And the other, other thing that we all know, I would argue, is that when we, also in our Western culture, finally meets the one we want, we want to share our life with, then suddenly the sexual act takes on a new dimension that it's a sign of our belonging. So people live like this. They become sexual active when they're 15, 16. They have a number of uh, different sexual relationships. And then when they are 27, they find the one they want to share their life with. And suddenly they have to shift their understanding of what the sexual encounter is. Previously, they could think, it's not a big deal. This is just enjoyment and fun. Here is no kind of uh, uh, long-term consequences. And then, suddenly, the sexual act takes on a new meaning. And if the one you love has sex with someone else, your <coughs> whole relationship is under question. Christian understanding is, we want to have the same view on sex all through our lives. We don't want to change it from, it's not a big thing, it has no consequences, to suddenly say, whoa, it's a really big thing, it can change everything. We need to have a coherent view on sex. When I was a teenager, Erika Jong was the world's most famous feminist, and a, uh, she promoted the sexual revolution. And she wrote a book, Fear of Flying. And she there presented a, um, it was a novel, uh, uh, and she, uh, uh, in that novel, she promoted the sexual uh, revolution and describe that as uh, something really positive and liberating. And uh, I don't know how, <clears throat> how sensitive you are here, European Christians. I, I read this quote in the US recently and come under some criticism because I, since it was a quote from a journal, I actually pronounced the F word, which in my country is not that uh, Shocking, but obviously it was in the US. <laughs> so I shouldn't do it. Are, how sensitive are you? We will survive. <laughs> Sorry? We will survive. You will survive, okay. So I usually don't use these kinds of, uh, of uh, words. So Erika Young invented the expression, the simplest fact that is sex without obligations through a novel character, Isadora Wing. 30 years uh, later, she was in Sweden and was interviewed uh, in one of the leading magazines. And she got the, the question, what do you say about this now, 37 years later? And here is her answer. It does not exist in reality. Just as a fantasy, sex always causes some kind of relationship. Interesting. She totally rejects what she promoted a number of decades ago because she learned something about reality. Lastly, in the film Vanilla Sky, uh, Tom Cruise enters into a, a relationship with a beautiful woman. But after a short while, he has an affair with another woman. When the first woman, Julia, discovers that, she says this. Don't you know that when you sleep with someone, your body makes a promise whether you do or not? Quite deep for being a Tom Cruise movie. <laughs> <laughs> and most, even Swedes, who see this movie, would say, yeah, <coughs> it's not a point. 
But if I say and present the Christian view, then people react. <laughs> say, what's that kind of narrow view? <laughs> but in reality, we know there is something going on here when, when you have had sex. If you go out on, ch on chat rooms, uh, you, you can find some really uh, sad and tragic discussions. So one issue that is discussed is, if you have had a one-night stand, should you stay for breakfast or just leave? What's the wisest thing to do? Why do people ask that question? Because now there is a question mark in, in the air. What we did last night, does that mean anything? Are we connected in any way? If I stay for breakfast, it may signal a connection. So most people say, just drop up. Don't stay for breakfast. But that just illustrates the Christian point that sex has something to do with connection, and people experience that. So they have pleasurable sex, one night stand, it's God's gift, so there's pleasure, even when you're using it wrong, wrong in many cases. But then afterwards, the reality of this comes over people. What was that we did? How should we know? Are we related in any way? And you have this discussion, should I? Stay for breakfast or not? Okay. Oh, it's five o'clock. Uh, are there any? We can take. If you feel, uh, you feel free to go. If any one of you have a, a question, now I, I can say <coughs> throw one or two or three questions on, on this, and then we tomorrow we'll deal with homosexuality and trans ideology. Yeah. Um, the two-part question. Uh, firstly, do you think that a part of the sexual revolution was reactionary or the antithesis to an unbiblical, over-prudish view of sex from the Bible that Christianity had previously? And the second part is, do you think there was any positive that had come from the sexual revolution? Yeah, thank you. Really good uh, questions. And so I'm so glad I can clarify uh, some things here. Uh, firstly, we are not looking back to a golden era. If you, if you study the 1700s and 1800s in Christian Europe, it's a horrible picture. Tens of thousands of brothels over, all over Europe. Men go to prostitutes. Uh, you see in the upper classes with, who have a, a lot of female servants, the men are having sex with the servants, forcing them upon them. They become pregnant and they're just kicked out of the house. It, from the house, the tragedy. So I'm not at all defending what was before the sexual revolution, because a lot of that was not according to a, a biblical standard, not at all. It was uh, male selfishness uh, to, to, a, uh, to a large degree. But still, there was a, a point from which you could criticize that, because the culture still, generally speaking, hold on to, there is a God has designed life, so there was a possibility to critique it. But the reality, there were many bad things. Uh, secondly, in terms of the Christian church, there was clear tendencies of uh, having a negative view on sex in from some, uh, some corners. There were, was a tendency of not talking openly about it. So for example, one really good consequence of the sexual revolution is that we can talk openly about our bodies, sexual functions, uh, sexuality. There is an appreciation of female sexuality that was not there before. It was discussions were only focused on men's need for sex, <coughs> which of course is a, a, a horrible view. So um, there are positive consequences of the sexual revolution that we now have talked freely, we, we have knowledge about the bodies, we, uh, we have uh, affirmed female sexuality, all that is very important. Yeah? How is the connection between the sexual revolution and materialism, the enemy? And in your view, is it possible to have a <coughs> of uh, the trans movement and materialism. 
uh, I think I, uh, we can come back to the trans movement and trans ideology t uh, tomorrow. In terms of ma uh, materialism, do you mean that in the philosophical sense that all there is is matter? Or you think in, or that, yeah, okay. Yeah, ab absolutely. So at the Enlightenment, when the intellectual elite started to dismiss God, so they put God out of the picture, God is not there. Then you have to answer, so what is there then? Well, the energy and matter of the universe. And we call that materialism, matter is all there is. Or naturalism, nature is all there is. And if that is true, uh, you have no moral norms. Because matter does not care about morality. Nature does not care about right or wrong. Nature just is. And that was what Marquis de Sade realized. Everything is just energy and matter. There is no God. There is no ethical framework for anything. What is, is right. And it is, a, it is a fact that I can use this woman. That is. And you cannot say that it shouldn't be. So he, he just um, formulated that philosophy very clearly. He wrote some of the worst books in Western history, which is a, a strange combination of philosophical reasons show, arguing there is no God, therefore we are free to do everything, with pornography. And he's intermingling those two things uh, in, in his book in, in, uh, in a horrible way. So he makes the, that connection very clear between materialism and no ethics. Who is the author? Marquis de Sade, uh, who, I, uh, who is called the founder of eroticism, Marquis de Sade. Yes? It's kind of difficult to frame the rejection of the sexual revolution that Louise Perry is trying to promote. And as women, I think it's, because a lot of times we refer to women being in abused situations. And as Christian women, how, how do we speak into that when sometimes the history within the church doesn't hear our voice, I suppose. And also, I don't particularly pertain to feminist ideology. And so actually to do that in a godly female way, it's quite difficult. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And I'm, I'm not sure I'm the right man to, <laughs> to answer that question. So I can just encourage you women to raise your voices in uh, in, in those issues and uh, start to formulate those things and, and challenge male leadership if you're not listened to or taken seriously, which, which too often happen in, also in, in Christian circles. But I think here it, it's really important that we hear, we hear female voices uh, describing it. Uh, so I know, I know male sexuality from the inside. I don't know female sexuality from the inside. I know how it is to be a man. I don't know from the inside how it is a, a woman. Of course, I, I know something because I'm surrounded by, by women and I'm married to uh, a, a woman. But still, here, here we need to hear uh, the voices from those who have the first-hand experience. Um, thank you for the presentation. And Mr. Formery, how do we Church that we own a reactionary force to this revolution, but to be constructive and not just come and say everything down we could like I feel like it's the danger. Mm. And we need to be aware of the risk and ask ourselves how can we be constructive in this topic? Yeah. yeah. Great, thanks. Um I I think it's, it's helpful if we look at the Apostle Paul. He did not launch a huge campaign against Roman culture as such. He proclaimed the gospel, he started churches, he trained disciples. And then he helped disciples to understand what a life uh, in Christ means, what it means to follow Christ in relationship to sexuality. Uh, and so I don't think we should, uh, we should make uh, 
main, our critique of what's happening in society, our main point as Christians or, or as churches, our main point has to be uh, to train disciples to follow Christ and live a different life than our society does. But then, of course, there will be some issues where it's important that we, uh, uh, we have a voice. So uh, uh, 12 years ago, I was very vocal in the public debate in Sweden on same-sex same marriage. Because that is, is an issue that relates to everyone. How should we define marriage? And I argued for uh, the biblical definition of marriage. Uh, uh, but, uh, but today I'm not, and I think that was right, uh, because it was a unique situation. Uh, but today I'm not uh, fighting a lot about how society should define marriage. They have redefined it. And there is no possibility currently to uh, any change of that. That can only happen if God sends a revival and the church become vital again and people uh, start to see the Christian point. What I, what I am doing constantly, though, is to help the secular world to see that we have the right to have our own perspective. So instead of immediately starting to argue for our specific position, I think we should, we should say to the critics of our, our position, so how should I understand you? You want us to be silent? Must everyone have your perspective? Or what kind of society should we have? My point of view is that you can have your perspective. You're free to have that. And at the moment, you are dominating the culture. So. Uh, but I hope you will give us freedom to have our perspective. And I'm happy to explain and try to defend my perspective. But, but the first point mm -hmm. is, are you willing to give me the right to have a radical different perspective on those issues than you have? And I think too many in, in our culture have not thought through this. They are just angry that we are having a, a different perspective. Uh, and instead of then immediately arguing for our perspective, we should argue for the right for us to think for ourselves, to form our own opinion, to have a, another perspective. Uh, and th that is, um, as I say, that is so important. Yeah. And I just have another question. Do you believe we can argue and achieve the same goal without having to be Changes our view about what other people that aren't Christian do about it, because we can say if we think it's only being a Christian that we can do that, go to them and say do like me, but you're not Christian. Like how do we manage it? I I, I don't see the apostles going out in the Gentile world trying to change people's sexual lives. They proclaim the gospel. They started churches, they discipled the Christians, and then gradually when the church uh, grew, of course more and more people had the Christian perspective, and within uh, or from the Christian, they were arguing for the Christian perspective. But the change in the whole of culture, it did not come about, uh, come, uh, about by first changing people's understanding of sexuality, and then they become Christians. It was the other way around. People became Christians, they were the growing church, and through that they changed their view on sex. And then gradually people started to see that is really positive. Uh, if I take my, my own country, uh, the, the changes in Sweden in terms of how women were viewed, uh, that there were no forced marriage any longer, that women had to say yes, and could say no, uh, that you couldn't be married to too close cousins or closer, all that came after uh, Christianity was established in the country. It was not that sexual ethics first was established and then Sweden, Swedes become Christians. It was uh, the, uh, the other way around. Okay, I think we, we need to... Uh, uh, to end this session. Thank you for really good questions and uh...